I've been watching a lot of uh, Iron Maiden videos lately, like uh, reviews, overviews, um, stuff like that. And um, for the most part, the guys that, that make the videos um, are a bit younger than me. Um, so they really weren't there when it went down. They're looking at it from a historical perspective, which is fine too. I mean, you know, they all do a great job. Uh, articulating their thoughts about the the albums or the eras or whatever but um, I got into them in 1983 with peace of mind and I've been there the whole time as they along with Duran Duran are my favorite band I know that's strange but uh, maybe it's a uh, it's an EMI thing I don't know actually what was Maiden on in America they're EMI in the UK. That doesn't matter. Um, the glory years are, are very well documented. And um, and I always find that it's kind of interesting to learn more about uh, the wilderness years. Like for my favorite bands, I always try to, you know, find the, uh, the content that's about the, the off years. So I figured I'd focus today on the decline of the band, from a U U.S. perspective anyway, uh, what it was like to have boots on the ground during that time. Uh, somewhere in time, in 86, you know, great album. Me and my friends loved it. There's a lot of stories and memories I have connected to that album, from uh, purchasing it to seeing them on tour. It was great. We all loved it. It turned out to be their biggest American album, I think, with the two million sold in the U.S. I think it still is their biggest American album. However, there, it was a bit... Uh, everyone kind of noticed there was a bit more of a pivot to a commercial sound uh, with the guitar synthesizers, and I remember hearing the very Brian Adams-esque B-side to reach out. And um, you, you could see that they were kind of making that pivot. But it was still great. It was still, uh, it was still very much Iron Maiden. A lot of people like to drive lawnmowers here. It's a, it's a thing, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, so everything was all good, you know, in 1987. They were everybody's favorite band, like everybody in my little clique. And a lot of those guys, uh, I'm pretty sure it's still their favorite band. Um, so, everything was fine in the world of Iron Maiden. My sister had an amazing collection of posters and picture discs and shirts. She was a, a huge Maiden fan too. She's a couple years younger than me. But um, yeah, we had that in common. We had a lot of music in common. But anyway, uh, Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. I remember hearing the title in a, a, uh, a magazine. We used to have to... Well, with Maiden, you could kind of get news on them. But most UK metal bands, you had to get Kerrang. You'd have to go to the, uh, the um, independent record stores. We had a couple of those in my area within driving distance. And it was MTV that... Uh, premiered Can I Play With Madness. And I remember that the feeling for us was it was uh, a bit goofy, the thought we had of that song at first. I love Seven Sun now. Uh, it's one of my favorite Maiden albums. It's incredible. All that stuff. I'm in agreement with most people and fans how they feel about it. But at the time, uh, that song seemed a bit goofy and I remember watching the video and, and being disappointment disappointment I remember being disappointment being disappointed that there was no new footage it was just recycled um, footage from the live after death uh, as far as the band stuff went and um, that stuff the live after death stuff was played to death I think MTV played that running free video almost as much as they played Home Sweet Home from Motley Crue those two are fucking neck and neck for play. 
But um, yeah, I remember when it, on Can I Play With Madness, I, it just, it was a lot more commercial sounding to us with the keyboards and the big chorus. And then when that solo kicked in, it, to me, to my ears, it didn't sound like anything they had done before. I'm like, what the fuck is this like C.C. DeVille style guitar solo? It was like a rock and roll guitar solo. Um, very unmaiden. Or at least that's how I felt at the time. Like, this is like a, you know, they're going for like a, 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 gla a pop metal kind of thing here. I just thought it was kind of goofy. And that was kind of the consensus. So then, uh, go to get the album. I remember seeing it in the store. And the cover just looked weird to me. It was like very, uh, you know, the sky blue. The sort of bright, sort of pastel. Well, not pastel, but it wasn't your average looking Maiden album. It looked more uh, friendly. It just it didn't look right to me. And um, we got it home. And I remember putting on, uh, you know, starting it out with the first side. And when he came in with that seven deadly sins, seven ways to win, and the acoustic guitar, we just started roaring. We just started roaring. Because we, we had no, um, we had no uh, knowledge of Jethro Tull, which is kind of what was going on there. So without any context for that, we were just like, what the fuck is it? It sounded like Monty Python to us. And um, actually the guy from Monty Python's in the, the Can I Play With Madness video. So right away, it struck a, a bum note with us. And it just fit in with how we felt about Can I Play With Madness. It seemed a bit goofy. And listening to the album, it was cool, but there seemed to be too many keyboards. And I remember listening, hearing the first time, The Evil That Men Do, which I like now, but that living on the razor's edge, balancing on the ledge thing, I'm like, this is like fucking, what is this? That sounds like fucking Bon Jovi or something. I mean, it didn't, but uh, edge and ledge, it just seemed like pop metal or something, lyrically. Um, the whole thing just kind of felt like a bit off. This wasn't uh, peace of mind, uh, for sure. You know, uh, or even somewhere in time. It seemed like they were going even more commercial. Now, in uh, you hear a lot these days about how it ha it's a very European-sounding album, and I think that's kind of true. Uh, to the ears of kids in the U.S., uh, when that album came out, just for, for contrast, we were really into Metallica. Metallica got really big. We liked Anthrax. We liked Slayer. And then on the opposite end of things, a Guns N' Roses was also really happening in that sound. So uh, Somewhere in Time didn't fit in either of those directions. And it didn't, um, it didn't sound like Maiden of Old either. It was just, it was much lighter. You know, uh, clearly, I mean, the whole thing. Um, we, we didn't really, weren't really big into prog at that time. So all the things that, are, that I think are cool about uh, Seven Sun now, uh, I forgot what I was talking about. Jesus, how's your Alzheimer's going? So um, all the things I love about it now, I, we didn't have the context for, you know, when we were 16. You know, so it was just kind of like, wow, they really softened up. That, along with our interest in in either heavier bands or uh, sleazier bands, uh, the interest we had in them was sort of waning. I remember that I didn't even go to see them when uh, tickets went on sale. I was just I was like, yeah, hey, you know, whatever. I'll, I'll skip this one. I'll see them next time. And my friends went, and they liked it, but they said it, was, uh, it wasn't sold out. It was a bit, uh, I mean, the way they described it, it wasn't sparse, but it wasn't as packed as, like, somewhere in time, you know? 
And I think our, my experience and our experience in my group of friends is probably the average experience of uh, an American kid at that time. You know, uh, there was just a, a lot heavier bands and going in the other direction, the more kind of uh, rock bands, glam metal stuff, uh, that was capturing sort of everybody's attention is that stuff. So Priest had a similar problem. Well, it wasn't a problem, but they just didn't really fit in to either thing that was happening in the States at the time. Um, in the United States, things are very sort of, they like to put things in boxes. It's very genre defined and they have to label things. And the audience is also very fickle here. And it felt like, uh, to a lot of us, it just felt like Maiden kind of uh, ran out of gas. And that's, like I said, the uh, it seemed to be the typical story in America. The album only sold half of what Somewhere in Time did. Uh, the tour didn't do as well. And um, I know the album did much better in a lot of other territories around the world, but in America... It was kind of done, it felt like. It was like, well, wh whatever. That's, you know... We didn't think it was the end of Maiden, but... it was. There just wasn't a lot of interest in that album and that tour. It just seemed too soft. And then there came the news about Adrian Smith leaving. Oh, before that, though... Right before that, you had... Tattooed Millionaire, which I liked. That was the first time I actually met Bruce... Right before the album came out, uh, I went to the CMJ seminar in New York, the College Music Journal thing, and uh, he was there. Really cool guy. Talked to him about what he was listening to, and at the time he said he was really into the Pogues, and he talked about how he was, he was going to cover Mott the Hoople on his solo album. I said, so wow, that's, that's really different, you know? And when... Uh, Tattooed Millionaire came out. I, I liked that album. It was really different, but it wasn't Maiden, so there wasn't a problem. Like if that came, it felt like an Iron Maiden album with that songs on it. Oh my god, it would be like what the fuck. But it was cool. I, I thought that I, I still like Tattooed Millionaire. It's probably outside of the uh, of the metal albums with Adrian. I think it's the best early one. There's good stuff. On uh, Falsha Picasso and Skunk Works, so there's good stuff on both those albums, but they were a little confused. You know what I mean? Like, it, it seemed like he wasn't sure of, of the direction, and I think that's been well documented that that's indeed what was going on. So, um, then I, I, at one of these uh, independent record stores, they had hung up a, uh, like a coming soon kind of poster for uh, No Prayer for the Dying. And it, that was disappointment too, seeing that. Because it was like, why did they put him back in the grave? Why does he have his hair back? It just seemed like, what, what is this all about? Um, in the goofy, like, Night Watchman or, or whatever he was, the, uh, the guy working at the cemetery. <laughs> I, I remember we were saying, is that, uh, is that Rod Smallwood? You know? Because it kind of looked like him at the time. Um, so, you know. It, they put a damper on things. That shirt is awesome. Nice shirt, man. Rush. I don't think you understood that shit. But the, um, so it, 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 there was some suspicion about that album. And then we heard Holy Smoke. And, um, yeah. It was, it was cool, I guess, but it sounded to me like something that would be a B side. It just seemed like a throwaway track. And I didn't mind the video. It was goofy and kind of ridiculous, but, um, it, you know, I, I understood what they were going for. They were kind of in a weird position, and, I, and you know, it's been well documented, the thought process uh, about trying to go back to a raw sound, and they mentioned, like, going back to Killers in the first album. That album didn't sound anything like Killers of the first album. You know, they want to go back to a street sound. No, uh, I don't know. I'm of like two minds about it. I get the idea. And they kind of at the time 
um, people were down on somewhere in time. It, not somewhere in time. Uh, Seven Sun. And to some extent, uh, somewhere in time, people felt they'd gotten too soft. In America, this whole change was because of America. I mean, that's where the money is. Uh, and they were losing losing ground a little bit there. And I think it kind of, uh, it scared them, you know? It's like, well, what the fuck are we going to do? So, it, you know, they were seeing bands like uh, Guns N' Roses, who were huge at that time, and it opened for them on Seven Sun at some festivals. And, uh, you know, the thing about Axl Rose, dogging them and stuff. They were... I think they they knew the wind was blowing that they were starting to appear to be uncool, you know. Um, so it's a bit cynical, but I think they felt like, well, we have to get back to some kind of street image that we never really had, because those early albums, even Iron Maiden and Killers, uh, the only thing really street about them were the album covers. I mean, yeah, it was a lot more raw, but they still had. Am ambitious songwriting uh, and the themes of the songs were, were very Maiden uh, like lyrically and, um, and musically there's nothing really street going on but I think it sounded good for them to say that uh, because street was what was happening then in 1990 and, I, and they you know I know they're the artistic integrity guys and they would I don't think they'd ever do that now I mean since post 2000 they're very much doing what they want to do and they have been and they have the attitude like this is just what we do if you don't like it stop it we're going to play uh, Matter of Life and Death in its entirety but back then they didn't have the kind they weren't in the sort of more comfortable position they are in now I mean now they're bigger than ever uh, they sell out everywhere they go they're an institution uh, they're, they've made it to a legendary status and there's no, uh, and they're pretty much set. Back then, though, uh, they didn't know if, you know, a couple bum albums or declining sales, you lose your label support, and, I mean, they could be finished. It's kind of hard, to, it's kind of amazing to think about, but, you know, they, they had to adjust to try to keep those record sales coming in, those, those ticket sales coming in. Their merch was down, you know, they were, they were, in danger of just becoming completely passe in a very short period of time. So, uh, with No Prayer for the Dying, they made a return to a street sound they never had. And it, it wasn't. It wasn't at all. Um, all they, they're like, they wanted a rawer sounding album. Uh, but they went about it a, a really dumb way. Uh, recording it in a barn doesn't make you sound uh, raw or street. It, it just makes you sound like shit. You know, that album... I mean, I like some songs on it, but it just didn't sound good. And uh, songs like uh, Mother Russia, uh, Public Enemy Number 1, they're, they're not all that far off from what you would think Maiden would be doing anyway. It, it, the whole shift to a rawer, earlier kind of street thing was pretty much just lip service. Like, they, they didn't actually do anything uh, musically to kind of go back there except uh, have a shitty production. <laughs> Martin Birch, I mean, you know, you would think he would have said something, but I, I don't know. I think at that time, Harris had kind of gotten himself in a position in that band uh, that you just kind of did what Steve wanted to and he knew best and that had been going on since somewhere in time uh, famously Bruce wanted to it made it sound like oh he was Bruce lost his mind he wanted to do this you know fairy music no I understand what Bruce was saying he knew that uh, to maintain like a relevant musical force they had to change a little bit and his idea of more acoustic stuff didn't necessarily mean it was like fairy music. He, you know, you have Led Zeppelin three. I think he would use as, uh, you know, an example. 
I knew what I know what he was trying to do. Go to do something a bit more artistic. And when he lost that battle, I think it just became understood that this was Steve's show and Steve was going to do what he wanted to. Now, Bruce was behind uh, with Steve the idea to go back to a more street sound, whatever that meant. Uh, apparently, they didn't even know either, obviously, when you see the end result. Uh, Adrian was a bit upset because he liked the direction they were moving in. Now, it's hard to say what would have happened, but it's interesting to think about if they just kept rolling along with that same kind of aesthetic and Adrian had stayed. The pro I like Yannick. Yannick's great. The problem with him is he's basically uh, a not as talented Dave Murray. You know, they're playing the same kind of guitar. They had kind of a similar sound. Uh, Adrian had that kind of melodic thing that worked really well with Dave. Uh, when you put Yannick with Dave, without Adrian, it just kind of sounded like, you know, double Dave. Dave and, uh, you know, Dave after a couple beers or something, you know. Um, so that, that affected the sound completely. It just made the sound really flat. And um, they lost a lot of their sense of melody without Adrian. Um, I was going to say a, a lot of the hooks, and that's funny because... It, the only song Adrian wrote, I think the only one he co-wrote was Hooks and You, which is, yeah, I don't know, I don't really, it's kind of cheesy. It was supposed to be a single. It was supposed to be the first single from that album. In fact, they did artwork for it that has Eddie attacking a guy in the street with a hook for a hand. And for whatever reason, I think the reason they went with Holy Smoke is because at the time, right prior to that, uh, he, the song was obviously about uh, TV evangelists, but uh, was it Jimmy Swagger? In between um, Seven Sun and No Prayer for the Dying, there was like a big bust. You know, one of those guys, one of those preachers got, got hit, uh, and I think they felt that it was timely. So they went with that. But Holy Smoke is kind of a nothing song. Like I said, it's like a B-side. And it just didn't really, it's not catchy. There's no, no hooks in it. I mean, it's just kind of there. It's, it's sound, I don't know, it's just boring. And the album, uh, finally getting it and listening to it, listening to it, it just, again, it just seemed a bit confused. It sounded like shit. Uh, and they had songs on there that if you just added some keys to it and Adrian's guitar wouldn't have, would have been maybe the next logical step after Seven Sun. So they just, uh, you know, maybe if they had stuck with their sound that they had going and kept Adrian, you know, perhaps there would have been, it, the diminishing return situation would have continued. However, uh, by doing what they did, they, they really screwed themselves over. You know, I mean, that was, uh, that was kind of the death knell. And then they came and, and uh, I remember they played near me on that tour they didn't during Fear of the Dark they didn't even come over to the east coast of the US I don't think um, but with uh, No Prayer for the Dying I had some friends that went they said uh, Bruce didn't sound good and half the place was empty they, they closed up the um, the top levels of the uh, of the arena so their their gambit to try to jump on or jump in with the uh sort of rock and roll sleaze metal kind of thing that was going on and it, not, not that like that's what they were specifically trying to do but they were trying to be more palatable to that audience by going with the tougher street image Bruce abandoning his sort of a Pratic vocals for something approximating like a Brian Johnson I guess but not really uh, it, it, it more he just sounded like a pirate you know that's what we were I maybe you know we're like what is he doing why is he singing like a pirate he was doing a little bit of that pirate stuff on um, on Tattoo Millionaire he was doing a little bit of that but it's like he he went full pirate on um, No Prayer for the Dying and it just kind of it just didn't work to me it just sounded kind of goofy uh, years later I like the album a bit more but um, 
And that, it has a cynicism about it that album. It, it's not like what the logical progression of the band should have been at that point. You know, it's like a, a, a hard pivot to another direction to try to recapture uh, the audience they were losing, or at least uh, stop the bleeding on that. And it didn't. It it, uh, it tanked them even worse. And by the time they came back for Fear of the Dark, uh, in interviews they were basically saying, you know, fuck America. <laughs> you know, basically without saying that. They were like, you know, we're a British band. Uh, if Americans don't get it, we don't care. So they had become very upset, upset that <laughs> about the reaction. Uh, to that album the thing is with them is, is like I was saying earlier people in America rock bands they like to have scenes you know they're, they're very much like that they, they have like this kind of scene or the thrash kind of scene Maiden didn't really fit in anywhere like that they were respected and you know people still like them but they just yeah their new albums aren't that good and, and the best ones are the ones up to uh up uh, uh, to live after death but, like even somewhere in time in the wake of uh, how things took a turn for the worse that album started to get dragged too you know people started looking at that as uh, the beginning of the bad point they were currently in so that got sucked in uh, to the vortex um, unfortunately and it shouldn't have been but uh, it was looked at as the as the point where they became more commercial or tried to sell out or something uh, and um i don't know it was a tough position for them to be in uh so i want to go into fear of the dark i don't know how long this has been going here almost a half hour. i'm gonna call it for now but um i'm gonna come back and do and just keep going uh starting with uh, a calculated attempt to recapture their audience, like one last shot, which, you know, as we know, uh, didn't really pan out, and Bruce left because of it, but, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting time in the band's history, and it's weird to think that they were floundering like that at any point in time, and, um, like I said, when I see guys talk about it in videos, they, they only have a historical perspective on it as you know most of these guys weren't born back then uh, I'm, a, I'm an elderly man so I was there when it happened so I thought it would be kind of cool to kind of give my perspective of what it was like for me and my friends there at the time so by after No Prayer for the Dying Maiden were kind of like no one was talking about them um, a couple of my friends were like you know, talking about how, how they were working on a new album, their new album coming out, but like they weren't going to tour America was the uh, word at the time. They ended up doing a short tour that at the time I didn't even know about. So for many years, I just thought, oh, they didn't even come, they didn't come here on that album. And the, and the thinking uh, among me and my friends uh, or, you know, in our group was like, well, they've decided to, to give up on America. They're a lot bigger in Europe. They're just going to stay over there. In the interviews at that time, uh, kind of they were saying that. You know, they were really salty about America. But the the, uh, the fact of the matter is, bands like that, they need the U.S. You know, they, that's where the big money is to be made. Uh, you know, it's good to be big in Europe and the U.K. That's good. But for a band that had positioned themselves in the way Iron Maiden did, uh, they needed to continue getting bigger and or at least maintain the audience they had and unfortunately uh they couldn't really do it but yeah i'll, I'll pick up with some more stuff uh with uh fear of the dark and then into uh those terrible live albums and uh the arrival of blaze bailey don't blame the teacher blame the school